All right, Chris here. Today I'm speaking with Luli Tannett. She goes by at Reason is Fun on Twitter, where she writes insightfully about all things epistemology and how that applies to fields like psychology, motivation and self-development, and other related cool things. She also has a website where you can find longer blog posts on the same topics, reasonisfun.com, as well as a YouTube channel named Luli Tannett. Now, I had a lot of fun talking to Luli, especially for the second half, when we got deeper into some of her unique standpoints on things like willpower, suffering, and the value of fun. The first half is also great, however, and we get into the weeds of epistemology and also her views on hangups and trauma. This episode is no doubt a goddamn Christmas miracle. Luli is a great thinker, and she's just plain lovely. So I'm excited to share our conversation with you. All right, people, let's go. All right, so I'm here with Luli Tennant. Luli, welcome to Do Explain. Great to be here. It's great to have you. So I'm going to start by asking you how it feels to be the first ever woman on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you about that. Where's Sadie? That's a great point, and I think I'm going to get in trouble for having you on before her. So this is not going to work out well for me. <laughs> but uh, I will I will definitely make sure to make an episode with her after this. Okay, cool. I'm looking forward to it. I actually wanted to start before we got into the conversation to just mention that this last year, since I got into Twitter and I started trying to unravel the critical rationalist worldview for myself... You have been a great inspiration to me, and you're actually a great part of why this podcast even exists in the first place. So thank you very much for that. I I admire what you do, and I hope that you keep doing it. We need more of it. (laughs) Thanks. Um, I'm actually really happy that you're making this podcast, because for a long time, I've been really wanting a podcast like this to exist. And I kind of thought like, oh, I'm going to have to do it myself. There are no critical rationalist podcasts. This was back before. And (laughs) now like there's loads of critical rationalist podcasts. So I'm really appreciated that you guys are doing this. So I don't have to. (laughs) That's really nice to hear. And you're right. It's been kind of an explosion of these podcasts now. So so maybe we'll even get tired of them and, and I'll have to retire. But All right, not for now. I've been harping on how I'm taking this epistemology class in some previous episodes, and I've gotten some feedback in the forums, some critiques of the Popperian uh, view of knowledge. So what I want to start with is trying to present the mainstream view in academia of what knowledge is, and then kind of do a root and branch refutation here. As far as I understand it, the common view is that knowledge is something called justified true belief. And just to make a practical example, I believe that I'm having a conversation with you right now. And this belief is justified in the sense that, well, I heard your voice right before this. I can see Lily Tannett on the Skype screen. I know we've planned to do it this time and so on and so forth. So I have reasons for this belief. And then let's also say that it's actually true that we are having this conversation right now. Can confirm. (laughs) So on this view, then, I have knowledge now. And to borrow a wonderful phrase from David Deutsch, he says, you made three arguments there, all of which were wrong. (laughs) Because I know you take issue with each of those three. So maybe let's start with the first one. Why is justified a problem? Yeah, well, I mean, so first of all, I would say that technically speaking, each of those three things are true. Well, okay, the way that you described it is that there, that you have reason to think that, that we are having a Skype call right now, and then you've got all of this evidence. And there is truth to that. Like, you know, those are reasons that, that it makes sense to think that we are having a Skype call right now. But right. what you're referring to is this philosophical idea that is justificationism, and that's the idea that you need to have a a justified reason to think something. The problem with that is that for each of your reasons, they would need justification as well. And so you can never fully justify something as in prove that it is without without a shadow of a doubt true and that we will always think it's true for all of eternity. 
So that's the first one. That's that's justificationism. What I hear you say is that the problem with having some form of uh, justification, some form of foundational belief or whatever for, for what you're saying or reason is that I can always ask, okay, but how do you know that? And then I say, oh, because this person told me that. And then you say, oh, but how did they know that? And there's there's no way to get to some source that doesn't need this justification. So it's kind of an, what they call an infinite regress. Yeah, and there's no way to get the source. And also there's no need. So the desire to seek justification kind of comes from this idea that when we have knowledge, then we need to be sure that our knowledge is true. Instead of thinking, well, what is true? Like, what what can we f- figure out about the world? It, it shifts the question from, um, like, what is true and by what means can we come to know about it to uh, once we have some ideas, how do we justify those ideas as true or probably true? And this this move is not necessary. Um, like, you, you don't need to have ideas that are justified or probably true. They just need to be better explanations of phenomena than the ones that you had before. Yes. And we know this because we have a better explanation of how knowledge works, which is the Popperian view, which we will outline in a little bit. But I just thought we will go to the next thing here. So let's Jump over truth and do belief first. What's the problem with belief? So one of the problems with belief is that the conventional view of knowledge is like something like it's kind of it's it's useful truth or it's probable truth or something like that. But it also includes the fact that there's knowledge in books. Like to say that, that knowledge must be belief means that books cannot have knowledge in them. But there's this... A thought experiment where suppose some aliens come down and then they wipe our knowledge of engineering and so suddenly we you know planes stop working and like we don't really know what to do about that (laughs) and and suppose they also wipe our knowledge um in the books as well then basically we have to reinvent the whole field of engineering from scratch Whereas if if they only took away our knowledge of engineering uh, or, or our beliefs of engineering, the, the things that are inside human minds, and didn't wipe the knowledge that's in books, then we would refigure out engineering much, much quicker. And so the thing that uh, is in books and in minds, that is the thing that I would want to call knowledge because that is the thing that allows for these transformations of um, like like being able to suddenly relearn engineering again. Another way to show that belief is problematic is, let's say that I, um, I've i had seven concussions in actuality. Wow. So maybe this is actually the case for me. But let's say that I used to be really great at playing tennis. And then I, after these concussions, I completely forgot that I can play tennis. And I actually believe that I've never played tennis and so I can't play tennis. But then I go onto a tennis court and somebody surfs and all of a sudden I hit it back really well because I have this inexplicit knowledge or non-declarative knowledge, so to speak, of how to play tennis. I still had knowledge, but I didn't have belief. So uh, that's another way to come at it. Mm, Yeah, I mean, I guess it's also, do you think that belief has to be in an explicit form or can belief be a sort of gut feeling? Like, yeah, I guess I guess you wouldn't call a gut feeling a belief. No, but even if you did, I could phantom an example like this where I didn't even intuitively believe that I could play tennis until I actually started playing. Right, right. But then there was something in you that allowed you to play and that something is knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So those two, I feel like most people can get on board with that after these sorts of refutations. But the true part, here's where I know that you kind of diverge a little bit from the, the classical critical rationalists. And so what is the problem with speaking of truth in this context then? If a theory has even one false implication, then by a matter of logic, that theory is false, uh, even if it contains a lot of truth in it. X and Y, where Y is something false, that statement is false. <laughs> like if you've got a true thing and, you know, another thing and you're saying that both of those are true, then that statement is false. So so that that's kind of like the, the logical argument about it. 
another thing is that a fully true theory would have to be perfectly defined it would have to be perfectly precise um because logic has to be precise to be to be logic so that's another thing and then and then i guess the third thing is that if we're expecting to make progress and not just run into a brick wall where no progress is possible then there needs to be something in our ideas that is not true so that some some of our theories must be false and in real life they are all false if they were true then we couldn't improve on them two of our best theories gravity and quantum theory these two theories are incompatible with each other so we know that gravity and quantum theory is false um and that is provably logically false uh, yet it contains the deepest knowledge that we have are you saying then that since every theory no matter how close to truth it is it always has to refer to other theories that also have to be perfectly true then which is very unlikely yeah i mean if if we want to talk about this sort of strictly speaking are our theories true well no strictly speaking they're, they're false but they kind of contain truth in them they contain knowledge in them right but is it isn't it possible that we have a theory that is completely true but it's just that we have no way of finding that out is that possible well it's like okay so the, the reason i'm hesitating on this is that i'm wondering whether all of our theories are actually connected with each other or whether you can have a theory that is sort of completely disconnected from all other theories and i don't have a i'm not sure because basically if if all knowledge is connected then you couldn't have that because then you would basically be omniscient i mean it is connected in the sense that reality is is unified but our theories i'm trying to think I suppose that you could take it further and talk about our language as a theory in and of itself that corrects uh that contains errors and hence just by that fact we will have problems. And also why would one want to have a uh, a perfectly true theory? I don't know like it's it's sort of if if we could have a perfectly true theory then that would mean that there would be no more progress possible in that area. I don't know that seems less fun than there is infinitely much progress that we can make. Yes, and we'll get onto that later on what what how fun ties in to to thinking and reason in general. Okay, but so would you think it's not useful then to even talk about what we're doing in science or philosophy or or in any quest of knowledge to seek truth that we're seeking truth. Is that problematic for that reason or can you say that with this in mind that we're only trying to correct errors and hence get less and less errors and more truth in each theory or something like that. Yeah, so there is a sense in which that's true, namely as as you just said, correcting errors and getting more truth that way. But to say that you seek truth as if it is this thing that's out there that you can kind of uh, like reach towards, that that is strictly speaking like not how it works um so i usually don't say seek truth because like okay what is the actual activity that you're doing when you are thinking about things and solving problems and making scientific discoveries it's not that you are kind of looking around the world and looking for some truth and it's like oh there's some truth let's go to that um <laughs> rather it's it's that you're looking at your existing theories which are full of problems and you're choosing some of those problems and then you're working on those and then you are finding some solutions because they they solve the problems that you have but it's not a process of seeking this thing that you kind of already know what it is or or something like that because that yeah that that implies you already know what the answer is or that that there is something that can guide you towards it um whereas actually it's it's much more of a an error correction process okay cuz in some sense i guess you could say that we we have an inherent need or desire to try to understand the world you could you could say that's equal to to seeking truth yeah i guess it depends what what you mean by seeking like like do you mean there's a goal that you have that you're kind of going towards and that that you're like looking for truth or is it that you're doing something else like you are correcting errors and that you may never find the truth and in real life we do never find the truth we just find more true theories or, or we 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 get more knowledge or less false ones might be an even better way to phrase it then but so okay so so could one say then that getting more truth is just a byproduct of what we're actually trying to do which is solve our problems yes and that's more useful way 
to talk about it. Yeah. I think it would be appropriate now then to just quickly sketch Popper's view then in contrast to this. You say in contrast to this, but I should say that he was talking about um, truth seeking as well. And that's why I said there is a sense in which that is true. Like we are like there is an objective truth out there. We are trying to find truer ideas. We're trying to sort like when we're doing this error correction thing, what we're doing is finding more truth or more true or less wrong or whatever ideas. Just want to clarify with this, I should have been clear. I meant the justified true belief rather. Ah, yeah. Right. Okay. So... Popper said that we start from existing ideas, uh, existing Mm. traditions, existing bodies of knowledge, inborn ideas, that sort of thing. And then we've got problems and, you know, we, we want to do something, but we don't know how. Or there are two things in, in our minds that uh, contradict each other. And so one of them, at least one of them has to be false. Could you give a practical example of that? Maybe you're um, a baby and you want to get to the other side of the room, um, but crawling is too slow. And so you want to try and find a faster (laughs) way of getting to the other side of the room. And then so you uh, and you look around you and and you you see that other people don't have this problem and and they seem to be using their two legs instead of their four legs. And so and so you get up and then you're like, you know, you're you're learning to walk. And then, you know, at some point you, you you run across the room. There's a state of affairs that is unsatisfactory to you, and then you you have a conjecture or a guess or an intuition about what would be better, uh, and then you try mm. out the thing. And so m- maybe you think that at first, like uh, walking, uh, you I, I don't know what what are, what are walking theories. I haven't been a baby in a while, so I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, I can't walk yet, so I can't tell you. But, uh, but you, you know, you, you try and walk and then you eventually get this kind of sense of balance and eventually you don't have to hold on to the rail or, or whatever. Okay, so a, a common critique of Popper is what's called the Dunham Quine problem or thesis. And I got a question or rather a, an argument from the teacher in this epistemologic course in our firm discussion. And I'm actually going to try to translate it straight off what he wrote here because it is basically that same criticism and I I thought you could do us the honors of refuting this for us Uh, let's see here so he basically said that oh this is funny he I think he just answered in real time now when I uh, (laughs) scroll down so that's pretty cool and I'm gonna read it but I also tweeted your article for the solution for this. And I said, uh-huh. if you're interested, you can watch or read this. And he said, thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. But so what he did say in in his critique was that one thing in Popper's position that I've always had a problem getting around is by rejecting verification and instead emphasizing falsification, he seems to presume that you can conclusively falsify it. And hypothesis, a hypothesis. But if that's possible, then there is verification anyway. Uh, namely, verification that, that it's in a certain way. Uh, namely, that we actually falsified something. Yeah. So if, if it did say that, then I would agree that that's false. I don't think it actually does say that, though. So there is an asymmetry between falsification and verification, but that asymmetry exists in logic and theories don't neatly translate into logic. And the whole point of falsificationism in the first place wasn't a way to justify theories. It arose in his thinking about things like um, psychoanalysis and um, Marx and some other theories, and he noticed that they claimed to be science, but they had something different about them compared with um, physics and, and the hard sciences. And he was trying to figure out, like, what, what is that difference between, like, Freudian psychoanalysis and Marxism and science? And so the difference that he found was that in science, then you can refute theories by experiment. And so the key thing here is by experiment. You can do a test and then you can have your theory be proved wrong or refuted in in an experimental fashion. I mean, to, to say proof like Technically speaking, yeah. there's only proof in sort of mathematics and logic. And as I just said, you can't neatly translate theories into logic. 
But then this was kind of jumped on as, uh, oh, this is uh, Popper's falsificationism and, and Popperian philosophy is falsificationism. And that means that you all you need is refutation and you don't need this verification stuff. But actually, that was just this thing to separate science from non-science. And incidentally, it's not even to separate science from nonsense or like science from false ideas, because there's a whole range of ideas that are not science, but also are good and useful. And, and so, so the entire field of philosophy. Philosophy is not scientific because it doesn't have empirical testing because it's abstract. And yet it is a, a perfectly legitimate field. Um, so it was just this thing that he was kind of, uh, doing in order to kind of solve this, this mystery of what makes that different from that. And then people, uh, adopted it. I mean, partly rightly, because having an idea of what science is trying to do and the fact that science refers to physical reality and therefore we should be able to make tests in physical reality. And that's actually a pretty good way of approaching science because then it, it's a lot easier to, to find out whether things are working when you're actually testing it. Uh, isn't part of the problem that e even during experimental testing, how can we know that that our instruments work the way they were supposed to, or even that the the theories underlying those, the the background knowledge, so to speak, of what we're doing in the experiment, are correct? Right. Well, this goes back to the justificationism question because this whole question of how do we know that they are correct. Like, it's not a question of, uh, oh, how do we have better theories or, or, um, oh, there's this problem with this theory. How, how do we correct it? Um, how do we know that it's correct? That, that's, it's, it's reaching for a, how can we be sure? How can we can ha have a, a justification or probably true beliefs or, or anything like that? So what is the fundamental difference then between saying that we have actually falsified something? Why can we rely on that in any sense? But we can't rely on justification. I would say you, you can't rely on it because, I mean, I, I just said earlier that all of our theories are false. But okay, but, but there is this question. You've done this experiment. You have some result. How do you know whether it's the theory that is has been refuted or whether the apparatus that you were using to test it is faulty in some way? Yeah. And the answer there is kind of the same as the same process that you apply to all of your theories kind of applies there. Okay, so I said that the Popperian way of thinking about knowledge is that you start from some existing theories and then you have problems with those theories and you try and correct those problems and do this error correction thing. So um, yeah. here in the Duham Quine case, you have expectations and ideas and theories and explanations of how the world works and how your apparatus works and the types of ways that it could go wrong and the types of things that, that could uh, be checked. And if you have a guess that, oh, actually, like I didn't tune it properly, then that might be a thing to look into. If you don't have an idea about why the apparatus would be wrong, then maybe you wouldn't look into it. Maybe you think like, okay, you know, it seems like the theory has been refuted. But I mean, it, both can happen and things get overturned all the time because actually the apparatus, like, wasn't there that thing um, a few years ago where with, with the, was it the Hedron Collider or something? And, and they thought, like, basically oh, they yeah. thought that there was an atom of light that could travel faster than the speed of light or something like this. Right. And then it turned out to be the cables. The cables were faulty in some way. <laughs> um, so this stuff does happen. So although you can't tell from the outset for sure which one it would be, then you can still do this thing of like, well, do you have a problem with the idea that the, it's the apparatus that's faulty or not? And if something is going faster than the speed of light, you think, oh, maybe, maybe it's the apparatus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But OK, so it's, it's uh, putting the emphasis once again on explanation rather than justification then. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's another asymmetry because you can have an explanation of something, but not that explanation isn't an explanation. So in other words, there's an asymmetry between actually having an explanation at all and then just not having one. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, I think the nail in the coffin point. Like you said, you need to be able to explain why the, um, uh, testing conditions wouldn't be sufficient or why the falsification shouldn't hold up. It's not just, like you said, a negation of the original explanation. That's a great point. 
So I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about a lovely four-part series you have on YouTube called How to Argue. Now, it has a few years on its neck. Is that how you say it? But uh, <laughs> it's uh, still phrase. great. Yeah, några år på nacken. Like that was a literal <laughs> translation. So yeah. I'm happy I did that. And uh, maybe I should switch to a Swedish accent when I talk, do the podcast instead. Okay. <laughs> it's a four-part series and one of the videos uh, has to do with meta discussion, which is basically a discussion about the discussion. So I would like you to just talk a little more about what that is and why you take issue with it uh, in the sense of why it's mostly a bad idea in conversation. So this was originally conceived of when there were these internet forums and there were these arguments and then they started getting kind of nasty and we were trying to figure out, okay, how do we have an internet forum that works well and doesn't have these nasty discussions? It's against the law of physics. It's not possible. <laughs> and it was noticed that during these discussions, what would happen is someone would say, oh, well, you're just saying that because you're a such and such. Or people would start saying, oh, I don't like your tone. And it's like, oh, well, I, I think that that's a reasonable tone. I'm just using criticism. And like th there would be this way <laughs> that people would resort to ad hominem and criticism of the, the way that the other person was speaking instead of the ideas itself. And, uh, right. and so this, this is called meta discussion. So meta discussion is discussion about the discussion or about the, the participants in the discussion. And the issue with meta discussion is, first of all, so it's an off topic thing, like ad hominem. I mean, everyone knows that ad hominem is, is an, uh, an invalid argument, but it's worse than that because when people get accused of something, their reaction is to be defensive and to argue back. And there's no way of responding to an accusation like that um, without going even more meta. And so the reason that meta drives arguments into black holes is that you can't respond to it, or at least the, the, the bad type of meta that I'm talking about here, is that you can't respond to it without going even more meta. And then you've got this kind of, this, this, this black hole of like going even more and more meta. And then each remark is a meta remark on the previous one. And you've completely gone away from the original topic. Black hole of meta. That could be like a cool band name for a death metal <laughs> band or something. Yes, death metal. So you're saying that if, let's say we're having a discussion and somebody tells me, uh, oh, Christopher, you're just such an asshole or something. I mean, that's true, but. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm even a self-proclaimed you're, you're the one, yeah. But <laughs> you're the first to say it. Dude. <laughs> I'm the one. So, I mean, there it would be a, a response of, of like, oh, yeah, thanks, man. Oh, yeah, you're really cool. Ah, and then you're all patting each other <laughs> on the back and there's just this positive meta spiral. So my, my whole example just derailed. It was the complete opposite. <laughs> but no, so, so let's say two people, I'll take myself out of the equation here. It's too meta. But so let's <laughs> yeah. say we have two people in a discussion and then all of a sudden somebody becomes ad hominem and, and just says, oh, but you're always so racist or whatever, even if it has nothing to do with what they're talking about. And then now the, peop the person uh, feels inclined to respond to this because obviously they know they're not racist. So then they start talking about why they're not racist, maybe throw uh, back at them a bad meta ad hominem argument of, oh, but you're a pedophile or whatever. And then it just it takes all the focus away from the actual problem that we're trying to solve. I'm very happy with this example. Super, super concise on my part. <laughs> so when is it a good, good use of your time to be meta then? Because I can think of situations, let's, let's say I'm, there's a certain thing, practical thing in my marriage that I want to solve that I think is a problem. But every time I bring it up, my wife gets really sensitive about it, say. And before just jumping into it this time, I say, baby, I know this seems to be a very sensitive subject for you. I just want you to know that there's no criticism and I, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but maybe we could talk about it uh, without you feeling threatened or, or something like that. Could that be good ever or is that also problematic? Yeah, I can see certain situations like that being where meta is useful. The, the thing that I criticize is the type of meta discussion where it breeds more meta. Um, where, where you can't respond without going even more meta. It's sort of like 
like okay so there's there's the topic of whatever is bothering you and then there's the topic of the sensitivity and it could well be that that topic of sensitivity is a valid topic in its own right and that you can talk about it without going even more meta um mm. so i guess it, it depends how you bring it up like if you if you start saying like oh you're so sensitive and and let's talk about your sensitivity then then the answer <laughs> might be like oh i'm not sensitive that's because you're being and you know you, you could have it like that but yeah there is a way of doing one of those conversations where it's like hey I, I you know I noticed that there is this issue can like is it okay if we talk about it and like I don't want to make you feel bad and so that I would say is um meta almost as a superpower there is a way where you can bypass some issues that you'd usually have with people by going that kind of just one step more meta just to kind of comment on on the fact that oh this is a weird situation or like haha this is so awkward haha <laughs> and and then it actually makes it okay like like oh you know podcasting that's <laughs> oh so so nerve-wracking and and but if i comment on it then it's sort of it's it's less of a big deal yeah uh, I got a flashback to memory now when I was just starting to date Sadie and I remember in, in, in the beginning you're more tipping on your toes and you're trying to feel each other out and it, it, you don't know each other well enough to let your guard down completely unfortunately but so I remember being at some uh, we hadn't seen each other in a while and we were at some party or something and then I wanted to lift her up and kind of spin her around all romantically <laughs> you know and I farted really loud when I did that because <laughs> I had to lift her you know and if I had just been completely cool about that and just said oh my god that's so romantic huh uh, or something <laughs> and then brush it off and kiss her or something yeah then it wouldn't have been a problem but as soon as I flush and just try to pretend like that was the floor creaking or something <laughs> which is so dumb because everybody yeah. knows but but that's that is a superpower and um not to brag but I would actually consider myself uh pretty uh good at that I told you when we met in Oxford that I want to get to the point where I can effectively ship my pants and be like, oh, that's embarrassing. I ship my pants and then that's not a problem. And then people don't care. Yeah. I mean, that'd be really cool. Like, like you would be such a cool dude if you could, (laughs) if you wanted to shit your pants at any time. It's like, oh, just shit my pants. Yeah. I actually really like that. I think that's a worthy life goal now when New Year's Eve is coming up and people are making goals and all that stuff. That's... Hopefully I never have to live through it, but I want to be able to. So maybe we could segue nicely into another topic that you touch a lot that I feel is related with the whole meta thing, which is hangups and also trauma. And so I would like you to start maybe by explaining what these two concepts are, respectively, and how they might tie together as well. So a hang up is where you have some kind of irrationality or some kind of aversion to something rather. And it's difficult to think about that thing or like you just you can't change your view on it because you've got something that's stuck in your mind. Trauma is a, is a word that I've just been using recently on Twitter because there's there's a whole sort of Twitter subculture that I've been enjoying lately that, that has been talking about trauma. And, and the way I think about it actually is more about uh, memes and meme theory. But basically the idea is that when you're young, you uh, get coerced in various ways and then you have to develop coping mechanisms or coping strategies to respond to these unpleasant things happening to you. And then those coping strategies get ingrained in you and then you go through life and you've got these habitual ways of acting and thinking that actually limit you in certain ways because, well, a common coping mechanism is to not think about the thing that hurt you or to come up with some kind of idea that prevents you from like considering that your life could be otherwise. Yeah, you're somehow deflecting from... For instance, feeling a certain emotion because you've built this conceptual structure around what happened when you felt that some other time. And so you kind of push to the side or repress or whatever you want to call it with these uh, structures that you talked about so that you won't be vulnerable to that same rejection or response that you originally experienced. 
Yeah, the sort of thing is some unpleasant thing happens to you, you have some kind of response to it so that you don't have to deal with that unpleasant thing in the future. And then in the future, the thing that you have developed in order to deal with it then limits you in some way. And so that that's the basic idea. I'd be interested both to see how how you differentiate them between a hang-up and trauma. Then is trauma where the, the, the coercion that happens that originates these hang-up structures that you can then refer to as hang-ups that keep you stuck? Or what's the relationship there? And then how does this tie into meta discussion? Right. So usually when people hear the word trauma, they think of some kind of terrible thing that happened, like someone died in front of you or you've gone to war and now you have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Mm. Um, Or you shit your pants. Yeah, or you shit your pants in front of the entire school and and then you get pushed (laughs) over and then you have to... Anyway. Um, But (laughs) this could get increasingly worse. Um, Yeah. But the thing that, that this... Twitter group calls trauma and that is sort of I don't know I like I don't know enough about mainstream therapy to to see how they use the word yeah, um, yeah. so I'm just going off the sort of common sense use the thing that I've been talking about here by trauma is a thing where something unpleasant to you happens and it might not even be unpleasant in an obvious way it could just be that your parents were not around to take care of you when you were really upset and maybe you were upset for a really kind of simple reason and maybe they had good reasons for not being around that sort of thing like i mean like i said i don't really think of things in t- in terms of trauma but to the extent i have been using the, the word lately on twitter that that's what i mean i, I mean something happens to you and then you develop a hang up in response to that Ah. And then the other question that you had about um, meta discussions. So I think a lot of these hang ups and things like anxiety is actually having this meta discussion happen inside your own mind. So what happens is that you start judging yourself and saying nasty things about yourself and um, criticizing yourself and having self-doubt. And like, you've got this running commentary of like, oh, you know, am I good enough? Is is this, uh, are they going to like it? Am I right? Like, are are they, like all of this sort of thing that kind of keeps going on in your mind, often in a kind of a, a subconscious way. Like you might not necessarily have it in words, but you have this, just this sense that like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not being good enough or I'm not uh, worthy or I'm not valid or all of this sort of thing. And all of these things are meta discussion. They're they're commentary on you as a person or how well you're thinking about something. Like you could also be like, oh, you know, am I doing this well enough? Am I competent? Am I going to be, you know, respected? And, And all of these things, again, it's about how you're doing it rather than what you're doing or what you're thinking. It's a bit like, you know, if you if you imagine a, a ballet dancer and they're in the middle of the dance and then you start criticizing them, saying like, no, no, you're, you, you've got wrong footing there. And then, you know, they fall over. <laughs> Whereas if they have finished the dance and th- and now they, they've sat down and they're thinking, OK, so what did I do wrong about that? Then that's that's a sort of a time when you can take that meta as as something that's useful, because when you're in the middle of the dance, what you want to be doing is thinking about the dancing, just doing the dancing, being in flow with the dancing. And if you start thinking like, oh, am I doing this right? Then it, it's very difficult to not uh, get thrown off balance that way. You're falling over yourself, kind of. So it's interesting how such a capacity that can be very useful to be, to be able to self-reflect and take a step back and be meta, like you said, and evaluate your own performance if you want to improve, gets hijacked in that way where it just becomes this intense echo that's just uh, throwing you off balance whether it's uh, in a discussion like this or dancing like you said but but it's I, I remember for myself when I was younger I skateboarded a lot and I I could always jump with the skateboard uh, I don't know what it's called in in English but I could do that when no one was watching but as soon as like the cool kids, at the grocery store mm. uh, we're watching. I was like, oh my God, I got, I really got to make it now. Come on, come on, come on. And then you never make it, of course. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and I think the thing that causes it to get hijacked rather than just being negative in a useful, critical way is when it then starts looping in on itself and you start thinking, um, well, either when you start getting critical about the wrong thing, like, oh, I'm critical of myself as a person instead of the, the precise way that I did that skateboard trick. It's when meta breeds meta that, that causes all of these problems. And that's bound to happen when it's referring to you as a person. Because this whole idea of, of whether you as a person are good or bad or valid or invalid or worthy or unworthy, that thing is not real. That is the whole crux of this. And if you take this thing that's not real, because it's a category error, because people are not um, good or bad, like in the sense of they are entirely good or in entirely bad. They yeah. People are these entities with ideas and some of them are true and some of them are false and sometimes they hurt people and, you know, that's bad. But it, you wouldn't say uh, Hitler, you know, he, for all of his bad ideas, he could do this painting thing. And so yeah. you might say that he has some true ideas about painting and so you could say oh yeah he was a he was a very bad man then the other person says what but like his painting is better than mine so what are you talking about it's like okay well yeah i mean like in the regard of painting then then he's fine <laughs> but yeah so the meta discussion loop i think is the thing that causes this issue it's it's because the thing is you as a person are the entity that is coming up with these ideas that is thinking about the world. And so if you say that this entity that is thinking about the world uh, is somehow not justified to do so, then what, what do you do? Well, either you kind of entirely stop thinking and then you kind of a vegetable, I suppose, or you look for something outside of you to do the thinking for you. And so that's the thing that drives it into this authoritarian getting justification from the outside or getting authority or or lack of self-trust that kind of thing yeah and i mean this all ties into how interpretation plays such a big role in how we see the world and how we navigate in the world and the fact that we didn't touch on that explicitly in the beginning but we ha i have in in different episodes uh empiricism and inductivism the idea is that you get knowledge from observing the world from pure observation so to speak and then you can generalize knowledge but um that's not the case you always have to go through l tons of layers of interpretation before you even experience the world at all and that's just as fallible as any other knowledge we have and so then you can understand how, as a kid that doesn't have that much knowledge of the world and, and can explicitly understand what we're talking about right now, that people can't be good or bad, that they in a situation that we now as adults would deem pretty insignificant or, or, or uh, take that to mean something really, really fundamental about themselves, why they are not good enough, why they can't be the judge of their own ideas and things like that. And that is... Uh, yeah, that's very tangible. Do you think that everybody suffers from this to some extent? Almost everybody. I think it seems like there are some people who have um, some kind of profound inner alignment or inner non-conflictedness or Thank you. Uh, they just don't and or like enlightened or whatever you want to call it. Um, oh, thank you. I, I think that it is possible to get to that state, but uh, very few people, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether um, it's known how to get to that state. I just wanted to pick on something because you mentioned empiricism and getting knowledge through the senses. If it were the case that we only got knowledge through the senses, that would mean that we would have to experience so much of the world in order to understand much of anything, because most of the knowledge that we get is handed down by books and by, by people that we know and, and culture. And so if the only way actually, like if the only valid way to get knowledge was through the senses, then it would mean that the world has to work by this authoritarian thing, because basically you would have to, there would have to be some kind of process where knowledge got from other people is somehow also justified or also a way that you get knowledge. Um, but if you can get knowledge that way, then you kind of can't have it both ways. You need... Um, so actually, I think the way that we get knowledge is that we have ideas and we can criticize them. And then when we hear things from other people, then we can judge it by the idea's merits instead of where it comes from. <laughs> 
All right, everybody, Chris here. So I just wanted to say that for those of you who enjoy the podcast, uh, there's now a support page open for Do Explain at ko-fi.com slash do explain. That's ko-fi.com slash do explain. So if you feel like donating, you are more than welcome to there. I appreciate it. Also, if you would like to go over to iTunes and give me a five-star rating and maybe a nice review there, it would be very nice as well. So thank you for all your support and let's get back to the fucking show. So another thing that also ties into pretty much everything we've been talking about so far, but it's your Twitter handle and your Twitter handle is at reason is fun. And I've always thought it was reason is fun. Like, yeah, Luli just thinks it's fun to reason, right? I mean, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. But your name is also the emphasis is, is on is reason is fun. Like it's the same thing and they're fundamentally tied together. So it's a deeper point than just your personal preference. So please explain. What is fun? I would say that fun is problem solving. And now most people listening to this will be like, what on earth does fun have to do with problem solving? I mean, like I can imagine maybe like doing puzzles, like I can imagine maybe that's fun for nerds or something. (laughs) But actually, when I say problem solving, I include inexplicit problem solving. So I include any kind of thing that you are um, learning from or growing from or enjoying. I think Mm. that that is, there is some kind of process that's happening in your mind that is making something different from how it was. Because just doing very mindless, repetitive things gets boring after a time. So I think that the whole thing of fun is all about problem solving. So that that's kind of one aspect of reason is fun. The other aspect is that, in my opinion, a rational view of reason is basically when you are looking for what is fun. So most people think like, oh, well, that has nothing to do with reason. You can do things that are not fun. If anything, you should probably um, discount your your intuitions and stuff because they're riddled with biases and you should do what's right instead of what what you think is fun. But I think that when something is not fun, that is a sign that you're doing something wrong because this this experience of not fun is one of your um, ideas, perhaps uh, an inexplicit idea, indicating that, hey, th- there's something that actually isn't quite right here. And you might have a factual error or you might have a moral error. or you, you, th- Like there's some kind of issue here where your mind is telling you, hey, this is not the right thing to do. And this whole like no pain, no gain thing or like push through the pain or, you know, do the thing that is right instead of what is fun. That is a guaranteed way to do the wrong thing because you are doing something that is wrong by your own, well, your intuition, but that, that is your, your ideas because a lot of our ideas are this sort of inexplicit subconscious and they are just as valid as conscious ideas. Mm, so many things there that I want to unpack. But so firstly then, this is, as far as I understand, what, what David Deutsch calls the fine criterion. Basically, a a measurement for whether you are actively creating knowledge or not. So fun would actually be a byproduct of actively creating knowledge. Is that right? Yes. It's a byproduct and it's also a way of thinking about how to create knowledge or how to create it um, better or faster. It's, It's kind of like a guide or like, I mean, basically not having fun is a criticism of whatever you're doing. So if, if you're trying to like figure out the truth of something and then one avenue is just like really boring or like you have to like ugh, go through this book or, or there's this thing where you're trying to listen to this argument and it's just like it's just not resonating but you think that you have to because it's what the teacher says. The fact that you're not having fun is an indication that that is not clicking with your own ideas about what the truth is. So you're stuck in your problem solving. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of a a hang up alarm, so to speak. Or just uh, that this is the wrong avenue. You might not be hung up on the wrong avenue because if you're using the fun criterion, then you do something Mm. else. Um, But it's just an indication that there's something that isn't clicking with you. 
this is great and so counterintuitive because we we live in a culture <laughs> yeah. where where fun is like you alluded to it's kind of looked down upon almost it's like okay fun is oh i'm having fun right now but I, i shouldn't really be i should be doing something useful or you know it's kind of guilt-ridden in a way and yeah and when i first heard of the 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 criterion i actually thought like a oh, fun like what is that like isn't that that <laughs> thing where people get drunk at parties and that sounds kind of boring to me so i don't see why fun should be the be all and end all um and i you know i had all of the the kind of conventional views about what quote fun is yeah. um it was actually uh, a friend pointed out to me the the way of speaking about fun here that david deutsch uses is the same kind of thing as what richard Feynman uses and having read his books i can see like oh that kind of fun like <laughs> there's this kind of playful sort of like slightly mischievous um fun and and there's this kind of whole and and the fact that it's tied with thinking about ideas and trying to discover things and and trying to do cool stuff and breaking into safes and like a lot a lot of like you know um antics um, yeah, robbing that, that gave me a much better so idea <laughs> right <laughs> we should go rob a bank after this episode lily but so okay so would you say that that fun in that sense is synonymous to what psychologists called flow a like complete engagement you're just completely engaged in the activity you're doing kind of losing track of time the meta is turned yeah, off and interesting. you're just immersed i would say yeah i would say flow is something like a complete absence of meta discussion um and that mm. sounds very enjoyable so yeah i i mean sure that that sounds like fun yeah yeah that sounds like fun <laughs> right. Like like fun is when you lack an, an internal conflict about a thing where you're just like so freely and so fully into that thing and there's a sort of a, maybe a sparkle of curiosity or something i don't know i'm just i'm thinking about richard feynman's uh way of doing it feynman is cool i like that guy yeah this takes us into the next thing that i wanted to unpack there this is something that i've i used to think that i disagreed with you on this and i'm not entirely sure if there are any uh, disagreement here or if we're actually more aligned than i have thought but i i want to go into this idea of how suffering is always a bad thing. And you you mentioned it there too, that um, we have sayings like no pain, no gain, and, and uh, you know, no, without deep valleys, we can't have high highs or whatever, you know, all these things. And I remember coming across this idea of yours on Twitter, and I, I've saved the tweet here. So first someone named Raghav Kapoor tweeted, Life lesson. Sometimes you must hurt in order to know, fall in order to grow, lose in order to gain, because life's greatest lessons are learned through pain. And then Luli Tanet came in and she said, my philosophy in a nutshell, the exact opposite of this. Now, I loved that answer. I thought that was great. But I also had trouble wrapping my head around what that would mean. So If you first outline your view here, is suffering always a bad thing? Yes. So the common view is that you need to have suffering in order to have the high highs, as you said. Yeah. Um, whereas I think that life doesn't need to consist of suffering or even have suffering in it. You know, we could just have a life consisting of lots of nice things. We could just have varying levels of niceness. And that sounds pretty, like, that sounds good to me. Like, eradication of suffering <laughs> seems like a good project. Are you crazy? So, that and, sounds but, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's possible. Um, so mm. that that's another thing people say is that, okay, well, it, it's a shame that we have suffering, but we can't really do, do any better. Okay, there, there is a, a philosophical question about whether it is possible to, strictly speaking, eradicate all suffering because surely problems are inevitable and do they cause suffering or not? I don't have a, a strong view on that. Um, but certainly the goal of like eradicating either all or as much suffering as possible, I'm going to say like, let's go with like all of it. Uh, just, just to <laughs> let's give that a go. Okay, so let me push back on that a little bit. It sounds great, and I'm hoping that you can exercise my doubts here. But so, some people, yeah, I know, I remember Alan Watts was a, a big influence on me when I got into philosophy. And he talked a lot about the Taoist idea of yin and yang, right? You need opposites. And pain, no pain, no pleasure. 
And I also want to tie that together with Peter Atia, who is a famous MD who has his own podcast now. He's great. And he said on Joe Rogan's podcast that his theory of happiness has somehow to do with the difference between being in that low and then getting to the high and the acceleration in between. That's what you feel and that's what's enjoyable, which is why doing something really grueling for a long time and then reaching your goal is just so damn satisfying. So what do you have to say to that? That the idea is that if if you just are higher all the time, there's this phenomenon in psychology called hedonistic adaptation that then that becomes your new neutral. If you're always at the the high end of this supposed spectrum, then you won't even feel it because you have no contrast. There's this Nick Bostrom article that um, I think it's called uh, Letter from Utopia. And it outlines a, um, a future utopian world in which everything is amazing and there is so much um, progress and prosperity and happiness that we we couldn't even conceive of like their neutral is something that is so joyful and pleasurable and happiness making that we can't even conceive of it now yeah how um awful. so and i don't think that's the pinnacle i think that there is an infinite amount of ability to enjoy life even more fully and so to say, oh, well, if we're just at max all the time, then that's going to make, um, that, that's just going to become the new neutral. Well, if there's a better than that, then, then we can always sort of have a, a varying degree. And I think, so basically, I think there's always progress possible in our enjoyment of things. But there's another thing here, which is that, so maybe the the intuition here is that okay when i come out of a nasty experience then it's just this, such a relief and it's so nice to to then do something that you enjoy and it, it's all the more sweeter because you are no longer suffering yeah I'm, like for instance right now i really need to pee and the longer i wait the sweeter the release will be <laughs> i'd say that the release is different from like actively enjoying something so yeah. there might be a kind of a physical sensation of no longer feeling this bad thing but that's kind of a different thing from actively feeling nice maybe i think it comes down to conflating pleasure and joy here or pleasure and fun and sure you can talk about these sensations but it's always your creative engagement with the sensations that make you feel uh good Anyway, so so the whole idea of just getting pleasure, that's why people who are drug addicts or people who eat all the time or things like that, that doesn't entail happiness. It's not it's not the same thing. So um, I think that's probably a good solution to that. Yeah. But I also have another thing that might be even more controversial, which is you are saying that willpower and self-discipline are bad things. And I think this is yes. something where people are like, what? Because well. that is <laughs> espoused as some of the biggest virtues in life. And um, what's the problem here with willpower? Yeah, this are you is, crazy? Uh, very counterintuitive. So let, let me see if I can uh, explain it. So if you fully enjoyed something, if there was no part of you that disagreed with doing it or, or had some kind of resistance, then you would do it. In fact, you would have to be pulled kicking and screaming uh, not to do it if that is a thing that you really, really like doing. So willpower and discipline come in when there is a part of you that doesn't really want to do it. Now, most people think that if you've got a part of you that doesn't really want to do it, but it is the right thing, then you should do it anyway. And that's mm. a very intuitive claim but this is basically saying that your explicit view of what the right thing is is the correct one and your inexplicit intuitions or emotions or like whatever other thing that you have there is not valid in some way so i think that if you've got some kind of resistance to doing a thing that means that it is not clear that that thing is the right thing to do because that means that you've got some kind of inexplicit criticism of doing that thing and 
that it is possible to um, think about it, solve the problem, um, figure out a way of proceeding that all of you can get in alignment with, like like both your explicit and your inexplicit or your emotions um, can, can all agree on like, oh, okay, this is actually a good thing to do and then do that. So it's basically the same fallacy of, of referring to sources that we talked about before that you, you're just yes. taking one source, which is your explicit ideas to be the authority here. And then you just run over, steamroll the inexplicit and unconscious ideas. Yeah, because you don't know whether 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 it's right or not. I mean, it might be. It might be that your your emotions are wrong, or it might be that your explicit ideas are wrong and your emotions are right, or it might be that both of them are wrong and that you just don't have a good idea of how to proceed. Um, like like all of these are possible, and you can't tell from the outset which one it is until yeah. you've actually done the thing of reasoning about it and trying to solve the problem and understand what the conflict is because this is this is a conflict between ideas which is the popperian definition of problem it's like you've got these two different ideas and they they conflict with each other and so like w which one is right well there's a problem here yeah and it ties in perfectly to the fun criterion and the idea that because i mean if you're having fun you don't need willpower like you said there are certain things in life that we do effortlessly all the time uh, most of my conversations on this podcast are, are uh, pure joy and I don't have to push myself to do them. And it's once, once again, it's, it's cultural. The idea that that's, yeah, but life is supposed to be painful. Life is supposed to be hardship. And to some extent, and here is where I want to play with pushing back a little bit. Um, to some extent, before now, life has been, it's been much harder to actually apply this in practice because we've had to do things merely to survive, merely to have food on our tables that weren't fun most of the time. And my criticism of this would be that in theory, I agree with it wholeheartedly, but there's also the fact that it might not be tractable at the state of knowledge we're at right now to always expect to never have conflict or to never have to use willpower or learn to tol tolerate uh, unpleasantness. And there might be a case made for actually practicing what we're talking against here, willpower, self-discipline, um, as a useful tool while also adopting the heuristic of always trying to be sensitive to what you just said, but then also realizing that we don't have access to all the knowledge we need all the time during the the time frame we have to say make a decision what do you think of that okay time time it takes to to figure out a solution that indeed may not be trivial and also it could it could be that in certain time bound situations it is actually right to go with your explicit ideas or it might be right to actually go with your intuition so you know it could be that your on a diet and your your intuition says oh, i really really want to eat the cake but your your diet says like oh you shouldn't eat the cake <laughs> in certain situations that it might be the right to stick with your diet because you want to get into that dress that you for the party yeah. on whatever next, i do want to get into that now. dress yeah yeah <laughs> i know you do um <laughs> or or it might be that you've just broken up with your boyfriend and actually like you've been like really hard on yourself this entire week. You know, you've had this project that you mm. made yourself do in, in order to, to do this assignment. And actually like, you know what? Having that cake is just would make things so much better for you and like, you know, would, would feel really good. And, and then maybe that's the right thing to do. And, and you can't really tell from like which one it, like you can have a guess like, okay, well, given I can't solve the problem in this time frame, which one seems like it, it's sort of a, a good idea. And then, and then you might well override one or the other just because you have this time problem. Um, so I, I should step back a bit. The idea that we can solve these problems and get less internal conflict is based on the idea or, or um, depends on the idea that these problems are soluble and that all of these problems are soluble um, in theory. Now, the fact that they are all soluble and it is possible to solve them all doesn't mean that in real life we will succeed in solving them. So 
yeah, it, it might be that you you trip and fall, and so problems are inevitable. It might be that that you know something happens, something bad happens, and you couldn't have foreseen it. And you know there was there was a, a, a twig where you didn't expect one, and you didn't. There was nothing that you could do to reasonably foresee that. Yeah. So those things will happen um, occasionally, but still, you shouldn't live your life being like, oh well, tripping on sticks is just a way of life. I guess I'll <laughs> I'll you know not really look where I'm going because like these tripping on sticks is, is and that's never so you you have to trip on sticks sometimes um like it's, you know in order to have fun like you know you, you can't what was, the, what was the tweet you have to fall in order to grow so sometimes you have yeah. to trip on these twigs in order to in order to get taller like no well th- no that's a good point and both extremes are bad to to uh, but the, the the fundamental point as i hear it is that you have to realize that problems are soluble and hence suffering for instance is a problem so it has to be soluble so you shouldn't go around not even trying to solve it and the same with willpower and discipline you could it's possible in principle to live a non-coercive life completely without willpower but we we might not be there now but that's not an excuse not to try to aim for that although it might not be good either to just reference that principle and then be completely debilitated every time you stumble upon something that might not be fun or might entail suffering or or whatever. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've seen when people come across this is that they're like, okay, so I guess I should just quit my job and like stop doing all of these things that I don't find fun. And the, the problem with that is that if you are just eradicating all instances of internal conflict that are obvious to you, what you get left with is the ones that are not so obvious. Yeah, fuck, I have no money and I have no apartment all of a sudden. Right, or, or even or even like really subtle things like, okay, so actually you can probably stay at your parents' place and like they'll, they'll probably like keep you up because, you know, they're, you're, you're their kid and, you know, they're, they're liberal and whatever. Um, and then you find yourself just like watching TV all day and not really doing anything and, mm. and getting drunk and like all, all of these sorts of things. And to you, it feels like, oh yeah, you know, I'm supposed to do what's, what the fun thing is. And so I'm just going <laughs> to like sit here and, and watch TV because that's quote fun. Done. And then you find that that you you can't uh, make progress that way, and actually it's an even worse situation than than when you are going to work because even though you don't have a boss that's yelling at you, actually there's still all of these processes going on inside your own mind that says things like oh well you know you you can't like achieve anything or like or or if you do that then you're going to fail like like the meta discussion might be happening inside your own mind but it might be subconscious so you don't notice it and so if you just get rid of all of the obvious like blindly get rid of all of the obvious kind of coercive instances where other people are telling you what to do and you don't want to do that it could be that you ha- have a worse situation. So with all of these things that I talk about, like the the fun criterion, don't do this sort of self-discipline thing. It's all like actually do what works. Like these are all uh, criticisms of yeah. certain ways of approaching life. Like if you think that you have to do what you don't want to do, well, that's not true. But <laughs> t- take it in context, like like have have a life that is actually nice um, and that makes sense and you don't have to get everything right. You don't have to be completely hang up free and conflict free and all of this sort of thing all at once. Like the point is you make piecemeal changes towards an improved state. And if you've like suddenly lost your, your job and your wife and your whatever, your kids, then that's for most people not an improved state that that sounds about right and so maybe sometimes it is the right thing to against your explicit will do the dishes so your wife can rest after a long day christopher (laughs) which i do which i do but um, yeah (laughs) yeah that's what she wants to do that's actually a better solution i like that um but so i want to just touch on one last uh, criticism of the idea that suffering is all bad before we move on. And that is, I'll use my own life again as an example. And when I was at my worst with, with burnout, experiencing that to some extent has led me to search for certain answers and accrue certain knowledge, create certain knowledge uh, that I might not have created otherwise. For instance, such a simple thing as being able to sleep, 
That's something that most people take for granted. I am so grateful every night when I fall asleep easily and wake up after a good night's sleep. That can make my whole day. Or mm-hmm. something like going to bed and waking up with my my wife since we used to be apart uh, long distance for, for a long time. Um, I, I guess I'm already anticipating your answer here. Uh, to be that I could have created that knowledge otherwise. But isn't there a point to be made there that some hardships and some things make you realize certain things that you wouldn't even have contemplated before and can lead you to a better place uh, than if you had never experienced that suffering and that bad situation? So yeah, definitely you can learn from hardship as well as learning from like nice things. But this this is kind of the fallacy that if you're not doing the hardship then you're not really doing anything or that somehow the nice thing wouldn't also cause you to learn things so uh, this reminds me of of the arguments against school that i hear a lot uh sorry uh against home education which is that uh well if you don't go to school how are you going to learn to read like how are you going to learn to write or 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 do math or anything like that Uh, how are you going to learn anything because like school is where you learn things but actually, if you look at home educated people, like everyone can read, everyone can write, you learn those things anyway. And then there's some stuff well, like, oh, well, if home educators like have weird gaps in their knowledge where they don't have the entire school curriculum inside their mind. And then I'm like, OK, well, you know, pe- people who go to school also don't have the whole thing inside their mind and they often forget it. But but the thing that this is missing is that when you're not going to school, you're doing something else with your time. You might be learning other things. And so I think the same logic applies here, where if you're not going through this hard experience, you might be going through something different or something even better where you, you learn different things. And, and so it's, it's very hard, kind of hard to say like, oh, well, hard, unpleasant experiences cause more good results. Like th- there would have to be some kind of argument about why the hardships cause the good results results in particular and why you yeah. couldn't just have like the hardships and then the nice thing and then the nice thing also produces good results and then it doesn't have the nasty bit yeah i mean i i've heard versions of the argument where they say things like you know near-death experiences you hear about these near-death experiences where people just changed their life completely because they always o- almost died and they realized how they were doing things all wrong and they quit their job and they leave their spouse and they do what they really wanted to do like travel the world or, or whatever but i suppose that's kind of like the success stories with entrepreneurs who just leave their job and burn all bridges and then they become billionaires that's like the one out of a very large uh sample of people who had a near-death experience and didn't turn out better maybe became worse or whatever yeah and there's also there's also near life experiences so when people become parents you know there's this new life in the world then there's a thing where people get their shit together uh so i think both of them can happen like like when you have major life events then something changes quite often because you have to think about something in order to to make changes to incorporate this new bit of information about like that you've you've gained hmm Because I was going to say that it seems like people often tend to skate in the middle there where they're not not that content, but they're not that discontent either. And uh, there's no reason to change. But for instance, with me, with my health issues, I didn't care until I ended up crashing so bad that I just had no other choice than to, to fix that. And it seems like that's kind of a tendency people have in general that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But yeah, that it can really be a catalyst to really change something. And, and you, it has to get really bad before it gets good. That's something people talk about in the political landscape or climate change or whatever, that we're not going to do anything until we're facing this horrible catastrophe. That's when we're actually going to realize that we this is not sustainable or whatever. And and that word and, and sustainability has its own problems. But let's let's stay out of that. Yeah, but large uh, large um, good changes also happen when uh, when good things happen as well. So it, it could be that that someone like goes to a conference where they learn some idea that then like completely changes the way they look at the world, or they read a book and then it's like, oh my god, this solves my my key life problem, and mm. and so. So yeah, I agree that when big changes like 
um, in the negative direction can cause other like changes to kind of incorporate that into your thinking, but also positive things. And so the, the fixation on the negative things being a, a cause of change, I don't see why we would have that when you also have that with positive uh, changes. Right. So there, is, there isn't actually an asymmetry there that's leaning more towards the negative. That's just a fallacy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, is that like uh, I'm trying to like model the mind of someone who who thinks these things. Do you have a, a thought? I think in general, this is the way people talk about it. That it can tie into the whole joy and fun criterion, and we shouldn't have that much fun. And it seems like it's it fits perfectly with the idea that we're supposed to suffer, and people are just inherently, I don't know, lazy, or we just do the minimum to survive, and and, and they forget the fact that we are creative entities. That want to have fun and want to create. Maybe the argument would be something like, well, the people who are in this um, stuck, kind of boring state won't actually see the better ideas because they're just in this repetitive life. Uh, and it is maybe it's more likely that they will go into some kind of like their problems will catch up with them because they're in this negative spiral and so on. I'm just, yeah, I, I don't know, like, I'm sure that also happens, but uh, it also happens that people are just normal people and then they discover a book that changes their life or a podcast that changes their life. No, I, I agree with that. But I, I, I still think that um, if you look at the idea that we would rather avoid pain than, than gain something good, like we were, I, I think that can have... Uh, an effect here and I, I i i would still bet that if you're let's say you're in a relationship and it's kind of eh, and it's not until your partner leaves you that you realize that oh shit i should have stepped up my game or whatever but i yeah i'm not sure i, I think you might be right that it it um it might be the same way either way like to, towards pain or pleasure but i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure I mean, so I think avoiding pain is a good thing, first of all. There are good reasons for wanting to avoid pain. And th th there's this, I think there's an implication here or, or a subtle, like smuggled in assumption that you, because you said avoiding pain, you value that more than doing the good thing or getting the good thing. But that implies that getting a good thing in the first place requires some kind of pain. And that's the thing that I deny. I think that it is always possible to get the good thing without any of the pain or suffering, I should say, um, associated with it. Like th there's a way to just kind of move upwards. Yeah, um, you yeah. don't, so, so th there's a common idea that people can get stuck in these local maxima. And so, so, you know, you're, you're looking around you and you are trying to make progress and then something seems good. And so you go towards that, but then you kind of get stuck because it, it makes sense given the situation that you're in now, but actually you, you have to go down in order to really go up. But I, I think that there is always a way of just making progress. I don't see any reason that we should have these these local maxima. Yeah. And I think this is the same mistake of, of conflating uh, pleasure with joy. Once again, pain and pleasure are, are opposite ends of something, but it's not the main thing. Anyhow. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, I agree with you. We could, by the way, go through that that tweet that um that you read out because like because because I said that this is the opposite of my philosophy, but like each each clause of that, um I I have like remarks on if that would be interesting. Yeah, right. So sometimes you must hurt in order to know. That sounds in line with the counter arguments I've tried to to make. Right. Okay. Hurt in order to know. So yeah, you have to experience pain in order to learn something. So first of all. Why would um, experiencing pain or suffering be required to learn something? What is the mechanism? What is the fundamental law of epistemology um, that requires some like? And again, it, it it reminds me of arguments about school. Like, oh, you can't really go through life because uh, without school because there are some things that you would just never learn yourself, and so you have to be forced to learn them. But for any of those things. Like, take algebra. So some, some children don't like learning algebra. There was someone 
once in the history of the world who found algebra the most fascinating thing that person could be doing with their time. And and that's because before that person invented algebra, it didn't exist. And so there was no way, there were no pressures on that person to uh, invent that. And so um, they were doing something that they had no idea if it was going to pan out to anything. And yet they invented it. And, um, and so now it's being forced on p- people, children who don't want to do it. Like it is possible for that thing to actually be fun. Like there are no inherently boring things that are worth learning. Uh, and, and we know this because the person who discovered it in the first place didn't find it boring because they, they found it more fun than like the other things that they were supposed to be doing with their time. Um, so that, that's one thing. And, and like also hurt in order to know, like this is a boot stamping on the human face forever. Like there's <laughs> like, it's a very glum kind of view of the world. Yeah. Fuck Friedrich Nietzsche. It's his fault. <laughs> He glorified it. He he and his fucking mustache. It's actually a cool oh. mustache. I can't grow that it kind of mustache. It is a cool mustache. <laughs> God damn it, Friedrich. Is that his name even? I, I just know his last name. I think it's Friedrich. Friedrich. Yeah, yeah, Friedrich, yeah. Friedrich, yeah. Frederick. Okay. Freddy, Freddy Nietzsche. All right. Yeah. yeah, fuck him anyway, and then there's- you know. Um, <laughs> another thing that ties into this somewhat too that's because I was listening to Sam Harris last podcast uh, episode right now before the podcast. I just listened a little bit, but it got me Pretty thinking po- about podcast podcast. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Buddhism, one of the central tenets is that desire is a root of all suffering. And one of the ideas is to rid yourself of desire because wanting something and not having it is why you're, kind of in a, a, a constant conflict that can never you can never get out of that. And once you get something, you want something else and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't like this way of thinking about it, that desire is a bad thing in and of itself, rather that it's there are other irrational memes and hangups around that. For instance, thinking that I need to get to an end point before I can be happy and relaxed rather than like we've been talking about, that fun, being creative, solving problems is fun while solving them. It's not when you've solved it and then you're done and then you can have fun or whatever. Um, how do you think about desire and this this Buddhist tenet? Well, desire seems basically like a synonym of fun. Like, I, I mean, or well, I don't know, I find <laughs> desiring things is fun. Like, but I don't, okay. Hmm. Is it though? Can't it be really frustrating too? Because if you desire can also be, I'm lacking something that I need. The thing that seems like it's going wrong there is that it's getting stuck. So usually when we have desires, then it's like, oh, this thing, I, I expect that getting this thing will be nice. Um, and so you do things to try and get that thing. And it's only when that turns into, I have to have this thing, otherwise life won't be nice. Um, like it, it's it's a fixation on this thing and this thing must be the case and no amount of evidence contrary will change my mind. So it, it's not really the desire, it's the getting stuck. Um, you could also think about it like it's the meta discussion on the desire. So yeah. the, the desire itself is great. It's the, oh no, I'm in trouble if I don't get this and uh, and then my life is terrible and oh no, like th- that sort of thing. Yeah, it's weird to put the emphasis on, sure, you can rid yourself of all desires, which would be a very strange state to be in, I suppose, or you can simply stop getting irrationally stuck in these metal loops, like you said. And I think, paradoxically, that that's a big part of Buddhism too, to see through the self. And what I take that to mean is to not... Yeah, to, to become way less meta in general, to not always uh, refer to yourself from the outside in that way. I understand that there are multiple different types of Buddhism and that Buddhism means a very specific thing by desire and there's the sort of Western interpretation of what Buddhists mean by desire or mm. what Buddhists mean about other stuff. And then there's like the original and then there's and then what is the original and then there are various different branches of it. Um, so the thing that we are calling des- desire in this conversation is just the sort of Western common sense view of desire. And I have no idea whether it has any bearing on Buddhism desire or like which Buddhism desire. So I just wanted to do that disclaimer. 
Yeah, you, that, that's likely right. Uh, yet, as someone who I haven't read original text, but I've been very, very deep into Eastern philosophy, and I think there's there, there's still. I mean, I guess you could also say, like some people do, and I'm not I'm not well read on the Quran or things like that, but there seems like both in the Quran and the Old Testament of the Bible, you can find pretty uh, harrowing passages that are clearly very immoral by today's standards. and But people can still pay lip service and try to interpret them in a light where it isn't as immoral or irrational as it, it sounds. And I think there are still points here that we made that would actually be an accurate description of, of certain Buddhist teachings. But once again, I might have misunderstood that. This actually ties into that, the whole idea of thinking and meditation. Because I know that when people like Sam Harris or Yuval Harari or, or, or other public intellectuals talk about meditation, it seems that they often make the example that, oh, the first time I went to a retreat and I, I just couldn't believe how distracted I was and my mind was going um, 100 miles an hour and I couldn't focus on my breath for more than 10 seconds at a time or whatever. Like it's, it's inherently a good thing to empty your conscious mind of thoughts and just not follow any train of thought. So it's kind of a thinking is bad. Not all thinking, but but since most of our thinking seems to be, for at least for normal everyday people, seems to be these kind of irrational meta loops that we're talking about. I could understand how it could be good to get distance from that and see how incessant you are at criticizing yourself for no reason. But I don't think thinking in and of itself is the problem. What is the problem? They talked in this particular episode about being addicted to thinking. And how you can't stop thinking. And I was just thinking there, maybe I, I'm an addict then and I have a problem and I'm just rationalizing. But what's the problem with thinking? If I'm thinking, if I'm in a flow state or I'm really thinking and having fun, I don't see any problem with being addicted to thinking, quote unquote. I just think that it's the irrationality of, of meta thinking or, or, or being stuck in hangups that could be problematic. But I, do you see what I mean here? Yeah, and I think I agree. Yeah. I think when they say thinking, then they mean something like conscious, explicit thinking. And in oh, yeah. order to see whether you are doing this conscious, explicit thinking, then you need some kind of meta thing because you need to be like, oh, am I thinking? Yes, I'm thinking or like something in words. And and I would agree that the issue is that there's this meta commentary that's going on. And I think maybe they would say that if you are actually in a flow state, they would say, well, you're not thinking, you're just doing or you're just being or you're just like, whatever, you're just like thinking about rock climbing, and you're just there with the rocks and, and you're not thinking at all. I would say that actually you are thinking, uh, it's just yeah. not this explicit thing. And there's not um, a kind of a meta thing that, that's going on. And the reason that, quote, thinking is unpleasant is because for most people, their thinking gets, as you said, commandeered by th this meta discussion process. And and actually, it might be uh, a nice thing to do to go off into one of these meditation retreats and start thinking in a way that is less susceptible to all of this meta discussion. Uh, m maybe that would be nice. Oh, absolutely. And I am a fan of meditation, so don't get me wrong here. However, I do think that you can even, you can explicitly think and be aware of thinking in a meta way without suffering and without it being bad. Mm -hmm. I would say you could even be in flow doing that. Let's say I'm actively trying to write lyrics for a song or, or thinking explicitly about a problem. I definitely think you can, you can get lost in explicit thinking as well in a good sense. So I, I think I just wanted to perform an exorcism on the idea that there's, there's somehow a higher state to not be thinking consciously than to be thinking rather than having the measuring stick of am I having fun? Am I conflicted? That's the important part, not whether you're thinking or, or not. Absolutely. All right, Lily, this has been a masterclass for me. It's been really fun to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Like I've told Charlie before, you are. there's no way in hell that you're getting off with just doing one episode with me. So just get ready for that. <laughs> okay. So uh, stay cool until then, and I'll talk to you soon. Cool. Have a good night.